This is the Ted Walshin Podcast. Brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted Wallachin. Thanks very much and welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Glad you are with us. If it's your first time, welcome aboard. Glad that you're here. And if uh, you're a repeat listener, keep repeating. It's good for you. Listen, this week, my special guest uh, has won literally hundreds, hundreds of national and international radio and television commercial awards for his writing and directing. He is a much sought after speaker. He's written three bestsellers, including his latest, My Best Mistake. He's been bestowed honorary degrees by both St. Mary's and McMaster University, as well as Lifetime Achievement Awards from the American Marketing Association, the Advertising and Design Club of Canada, and the Television Advertising Bureau. His weekly CBC radio show, Under the Influence, is now in its 18th year and draws a million listeners per week in Canada. And his podcast of the same name has had over 50 million downloads. His radio show, as I mentioned, airs on CBC Radio One Thursday and Saturday at 1130. And then it's on Sirius XM Channel 169 Fridays at 4 p.m. And his podcast drops Saturday and it's available on your favorite podcast app. Terry O'Reilly, it's great to talk to you again. How are you, my friend? I am fine, Ted. Great to talk to you, too. So under the influence, you just began your, what is this, 18th season now? This is the 18th season of me being on CBC, and it's the 12th season of Under the Influence. Right. Prior to that, I had another series called Age of Persuasion. Right. And this is, I didn't realize this, and we've talked a number of times, but we have a mutual friend that I didn't realize we did either, Larry McGinnis who uh, was really played a pivotal role in, in launching this whole concept for you. Tell us, tell us about that back in 19 or 2005, I guess. Right. Yeah. So Larry played a big part in the, under the influence and going back to age of persuasion, actually, because for many years, Ted, I would put on a creative radio seminar in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I would rent a big theater and I would invite 200 young ad copywriters and I would get on a stage for seven hours And I would teach them how to create creative radio because I was a commercial director at that time. And I directed about 500 commercials a year. So I had a lot of interesting knowledge over, you know, over all that time that I could give to them. So anyway, I was out for a beer with Larry McGinnis and a couple of other radio guys one afternoon. And Larry said to me, you know, that creative radio seminar you do. And I said, yeah, he said, that would make a great radio show. And I said, who would ever run that? And he said, the CPC. And I said, the <laughs> advertising free CBC would do a show on advertising. Yeah. He said, I think they'd do that one. And then we just laughed and finished our beers in the sunshine. And I went home and couldn't get it out of our mind, my mind. So myself and Mike Tennant, who was also at that lunch, decided to knock on CBC's door and pitch that idea. And lo and behold, they bought it. Now, it, it, it was, was it originally uh, O'Reilly on advertising? Is that, was, on For advertising? Once, yes, yeah, so that's right. So the very when they took us on, they took us on as a summer replacement series. Mm-hmm. So one, one of their big flagship shows went off the air for July and August. They put us on the air for eight weeks, and, and we, we called it O'Reilly on advertising to play off of Ogilvy on advertising, one of the most famous books written on the business by David Ogilvy. Anyway. They had such a great response to our show, Ted, that they kept us on for the entire year and then kept re- and then from that point on, we were renewed every year. So on the second year, we when we knew we were going to be a recurring show, mm-hmm. Mike and I really retooled the show completely and changed the name to The Age of Persuasion, which it's uh, kept for the next five years until 2011. And it became Under the Influence. 
and, and at which point, the, really, the the program changed as well because it became not just about advertising, but advertising and marketing as well. Yeah, because advertising is just that one tendril of marketing. So yeah, yeah, we were focused on advertising in the first series, and then I broadened the aperture in a huge way for Under the Influence. And I had this conversation with a friend the other day, and he said, well, really, what's the difference between advertising and marketing? Mm. And I, I, he kind of stumped me there for a second, and I know there is, but how would you put it? Well, advertising is one aspect of it. So there can also be logos and packaging and direct selling and, and shelf space and, right. uh, direct, you know, uh, direct mail. Like there's just so many aspects that, I mean, digital, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So advertising as one is just one, one aspect of marketing. Right. How much do you think people are relying on social media today for, for advertising? And is it as effective as, as people might think? Because I see people walking around saying, well, I've got, you know, 8 million followers on Instagram or 150,000 people follow me on Twitter. But does that necessarily mean that they're really paying attention to what you're saying on Twitter? Or does that just mean that they, for some reason, decided to follow you? Well, most, most of the money in marketing has moved to the digital sphere. There's no doubt about that. Um, well, that, that's the conundrum of, of social media, really, Ted, is if you have, you know, 3,500 likes on a post, does that mean anybody's buying anything? I mean, it's hard to, to extrapolate that into an actual sale, unless, mm-hmm. of course, you send them to a website where there is product that they can uh, buy so you can track that or my wife has a retail store and she sells right off Instagram she'll post items she has and people just message her saying I want to buy it how do I do that and then mm-hmm. they do the online transaction it was, it was a fascinating documentary that came out I think about a year ago uh, talking about social media and a lot of uh, how a lot of it is, is these likes and followers are purchased or they're bots they're not yeah. even real people and, yeah. and, and there's people getting sucked into that thinking, well, well, you know, I'm going to put my product with this influencer and we can talk about what influencers, what, whatever that means yeah. <laughs> in, in, in a second. How, how often do you think that's going on? How well, much of it is legitimate? There's a big um, conversation happening in the advertising and marketing business for what they call brand safety. So while it's a little different, brand safety is so you don't want to have your product algorithmically put on a website of like white supremacists because algorithms are just computers making decisions. They don't can't really make ethical decisions. Right. So there's that. And then there's people who buy followers instead of growing them organically. So it's, it's a difficult time for, for advertisers to know what is real and what isn't, but big brands like Procter and Gamble, which are one of the biggest advertisers in the world demand that a media channel prove that its listeners, viewers, or watchers are organic or they won't spend the money. So that's a huge change from the biggest advertiser in the world. So that'll have a ripple effect to clean it up. There are also uh, companies who advertise not based solely on numbers, but on the relationship that they have with the clients or with whether, whether it be someone who's endorsing their product or whether it be a radio station, a television station, a podcast, for example, and we'll buy that way because they're growing this relationship that they feel is going to grow with their product. And that person understands the product better. And it's, it's more of a personal thing and yeah. it's not necessarily based always on numbers. Yeah. And that, that I think is probably the best way to go any way you look at it because it's a, it's a good, it's a hand in glove fit there. The, the yeah. you know, personality of the host or the theme of the program has some kind of simpatico link with the product. And that always is a better scenario because remember this, Ted, that all advertising is an interruption. And if you, <laughs> and you want to, my job as a copywriter and as a director for all those years is to try to make that interruption as polite or as amusing as possible. So it's twice as hard when you're interrupting a program that has nothing to do with your product and much easier to interrupt a, pro- a program where the, the product fits. Don't you love it when you run into people who say to you, I hate advertising. I can't stand advertising. I can't stand any of it. On the radio and television, you can't stand any ads. And then inadvertently, you catch them quoting something from an ad 
uh, whether it be a slogan or or they say, oh, you got to try out this. But where did you find out about that? Oh, I saw this ad and oh, you saw this mm-hmm. ad. Oh, I see. <laughs> so so the ad is so the ones that you hate actually convinced you that you should be buying this type of uh, running shoe now. Is that right? Yeah, very, very true. Very true. I think av- people hate advertising in general, but like advertising specifically, meaning that they have their favorite ads and they can quote from their ads and some and ads do persuade them to buy certain products. The email, Ted, that we get most of all over, over all these years, it's almost always the same. It's somebody saying to me, hate advertising, love your show, hate advertising, <laughs> which just makes me laugh. But uh, I mean, my, my mission is really to help people understand how advertising works. I don't really defend it or I don't attack it. I go, I just take you into the boardroom and go, here's the thinking. Yeah. Terry O'Reilly is, is my guest. He is the host of Under the Influence. I was fascinated uh, in, on your website. There's a, there's a page called Fun Facts. And I, and I yes. wanted to share some of these just to sort of open the curtain a little, peek behind the curtain a little bit about, about how this, this program of yours, this fascinating program, uh, which has had nearly, what, 50 million podcast downloads? Yeah. Which is yeah. quite amazing. I mean, it's available on, on on CBC Radio. You can catch it on Thursdays at 11.30 and Saturday at 11.30. That's a.m. And right. then Sirius XM, uh, channel 169, Fridays at 4. And then WBEZ, or BEZ, I guess, in Z, Chicago, yep. Saturday morning at 6.30. And then parenthetically, it says yawn. As in <laughs> yes. 6.30. Yeah, well, somebody's up at 6.30. But it, it, right. it, it fascinates me that, that the amount of people and the amount of time that it takes uh, to do one episode. You said it, it's 12 hours to record and mix each episode. And these are half yeah, an hour I, episodes. And some people would, yeah. would think, why does it take that much time? If you even back that up further, Ted, I mean, depending on the topic or the theme of that episode, it, yeah. I split the research between myself and one other researcher. So we'll split it in half. I'll do half of it and the researcher will do the other half. Um, it may take between 20 and 30, maybe even 40 hours of research for a half hour show because we're chasing things all over the world. I'm reading an entire book just to do that week's show. I mean, it's a, a ton of time. Mm-hmm. So there's that. And then it takes me about two and a half days to write the show. I'll get back about 100 to 150 pages of research. It'll take me two days to go through that research. And then I'll have to sit with it for a while and figure out what the show is in my head. And then um, and then it gets a record day. And it's 12 hours because it's a very ambitious show. There's a lot of sound effects. There's music. There's, there's clips. There's advertisements. Um, so it's, it's a, it takes time to assemble and record and then mix it in real time. Yeah. It, which is quite, quite fascinating because many people think, as people used to say to me, wow, you, you, you work in radio, I man, what a, what a great job you're on your, so you talk for four hours, big deal. <laughs> you know, it's just like, uh, yeah, but you know, I've got to interview this guy who wrote this book and, and I have to read the book because if I don't read the book, I'm going to sound like an idiot and I can't speed read a book in like an hour and a half. It's days to, to read, you know, I mean. Uh, yeah, it's not a quick, reading a book is not a quick thing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fast reader, Ted, and it takes me days, days to read a book. But even to, even like reading a book or, for example, I, I have documentary documentarians on as guests quite often. And so you'll watch a documentary, it's an hour, an hour and a half long. But for me, that takes me like three hours to watch because I'm watching, then I've got to stop, and then I've got to take notes, and then I've got to replay it. And is that what he said? What did he say? How did he say that? And, and it's so it's not like you watch it and then you just sit and talk about it. You you, you got to have so all true. your notes together, right? So true. And then you need thinking time. I mean, there's it's just to formulate your thoughts on on that. And and when you're writing a show like mine, which is really a documentary style, is to really. What are the what are the stories I'm going to tell in this show, and how can I link them, and what are the beats I want to uh, you know bring forward, and then what's my, how do I wrap it all up? What's the connective tissue between all of this? I mean, it, it takes thinking time. Yeah, exactly. And while you're doing this, you can't be doing this for an entire nine hour day. You've got to walk away from it because it'll make you crazy. It's like okay, yep, I've read I read I've read too much about this already. I know too much about earthworms. I've got to move on. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know, it's so true. And and you also need to, you know, you, you need to let your subconscious get a, a shot at the steering wheel too, because that's when you'll make your creative leaps. And I always found even as a copywriter, I'd sit all day at my desk trying to come up with an idea for a product. And then I just give up for a time and go cut the lawn. And then the idea would always arrive when I'm doing something else. Because mm-hmm. that was this your your mind tinkering with the idea with the problem. Now, have you has it ever happened where you've recorded a program? You're happy with the program. The program goes to air. You get feedback. Most most of it is going to be positive. And someone says, "Oh, you know, you should have mentioned this, or you didn't. You forgot to mention this about that person or this." And then you think to yourself, "Damn, how did I miss that?" Yeah. That that has not often, but that has happened to me. And the funny thing about that is sometimes you'll miss the most obvious thing. Yeah. In your search for other ideas, you'll you actually overlook maybe the most obvious story that would have made that episode even better. And that that's when you really knock your head against the wall. And is it difficult sometimes to to try to wrap your head around everybody else's head? And by that I mean thinking that okay, if you're writing about uh, as you did in in in, in my big mistake, you talk about various uh, uh, athletes, for example, and how they yeah. made their success by mistake. And you yeah. think, well, you know so much about this. You have to sit back and say, wait a minute, I can't assume that everybody even knows what the sport of hockey is. Yeah. I mean, I, see, here's the interesting thing. My show is aimed at the average Canadian. I don't, my show is not aimed at marketers. That means that all the jargon that the ad industry uses, and nobody uses more jargon than advertising, I have to eliminate from the show because it's like Mm -hmm. it's too inside baseball. And then if I'm talking about something like recently, for example, I was writing about geofencing in advertising where, and I, you know, I have to explain what that is to the layman, that it's where advertisers can actually choose a geographical location, then fence it off to even just 20 feet. So if you're just passing a store, your phone will pick up the fact you're 20 feet from the store and the store will send you a coupon like that's geo. But I would have to explain what that is before I could tell the story about geofencing. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so sometimes you have to catch yourself in the end and say, wait a minute, I I can't assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about here. It's like, and I find that sometimes as well with, with radio announcers who, uh, who are in love with their voices and, and are in love with their, with the, the vast thesaurus that they probably sleep with and, and they, they love tossing out <laughs> these words and not, you know, thinking that they're impressing people, but in many cases you're pissing people off because you're thinking, I have no idea what that word means because nobody has ever used that word in my life. You know what? It's so true. I am the, I'm the plainest writer you've ever come across my writing. I keep it very, very simple. I don't use any tricky words. I write as I talk. And um, the CBC audience is very interesting. There, there's definitely the uh, vocabulary police out there. <laughs> if I misuse a word, the amount of email, I'm sure you had that in your career too, Ted, the amount of emails I get. You said ring instead of rung, you know, that kind of uh, thing, which yeah. can drive me crazy after a while. But uh, I, I try and make it really simple language, but I try and make real simple language interesting. Yeah, it's like the lay down, I'm going to lay down, I'm going to lie down. I just dance yeah. around and say, I'm just going to put myself on the couch. <laughs> just get rid of that problem. Yeah. Get rid of the word completely. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend, Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's one 309 387 or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Hey, it's Ted Wallison for Tom's Place, and we love offering incredible deals, we're open for business, and more importantly, on sale. Check out our website, toms place 
com for details about our specials and ours. We have no supply chain issues. We are fully stocked. In fact, we have huge amounts of inventory that we want to move, and the deals are simply amazing. Prices lower than ever in the 60-plus history of Tom's Place. Shirts, sweaters, coats, sports jackets, suits, and more priced to be given away to you. And we've got gift certificates as well. Tom's Place Boxing Week sales on now, Kensington Market. So now, more than ever, you know it's important to shop local. Thank you for your support. Tom's Place, the Boxing Week sale, will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Uh, under the influence is the program, uh, and the host is Terry O'Reilly. He is my guest. Let's talk about some of the... Uh, what's in store for the folks? Because you just launched the uh, season eighteen a couple of weeks ago. Um, That's right. Something interesting that I heard the episode on. Uh, you, t- you talk about the death of of, of Her Majesty the Queen, the yes. recent passing, and something called royal warrants, which I had never heard of before. That's a, that was a very interesting aspect of that show. So that show is about how the Queen's death affects marketing, and and one of the biggest ways it affected marketing was that. The, the royal family has given out over 800 royal warrants. So that means that it is a product that the royal family uses that they feel should be singled out for its excellence. And they, uh, they, allow, they, they give it a royal warrant that allows the product to say on its label, for example, by appointment of the queen or by appointment of, of Prince Charles, now King Charles. Anyway, the queen herself had given out 600 of these to... You know, um, it could be as mundane as a dry cleaner, and it could be as important as whoever caters the food to royal events. Mm-hmm. But, and then uh, Prince Charles had given out, uh, I think, 180, and then the late Prince Philip had given out some. But the Queen had the majority, 600. When a royal family member passes away, all those warrants become null and void. Which is interesting to me because that means these 600 companies now have to reapply to King Charles to see if they can get the royal warrant back. And if he decides not to grant it, which he just may, that's going to cost them millions of dollars because they have to take that by appointment of the queen off their logo, their packaging, their letterhead, their signage, their trucks, everything. So it's a huge, there's huge implications there, which I I think is just an un explored part of of the marketing world so really it's 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 an endorsement is what it is they don't call it that they they well, feel they the wouldn't. royal family yeah they are the original endorsers though because that the the uh, act of giving out royal warrants goes back i can't remember exactly now to like you know king henry the third or something in the seven in the 1700s so they are the original influencers but they don't get paid necessarily for this or do they no, it doesn't cost anything to, to have the royal warrant, Ted, and uh, they don't get those products. The royal family do not get products for free. There's no exchange of money in either way, going or coming. It's just something that's been granted. So, for example, if, if they decided that they were going to uh, um, offer up a, a royal warrant for a sherry that, 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 that the queen likes to sip on, Yep. She would not be able to accept, say, a, a case of sherry at Christmas time? No, no, no. I think they're pretty strict about that, actually. Now, some royal warrants have been taken away over time, which is an interesting aspect also that I mentioned on the show. For example, the company that provides the lingerie to the queen, mm-hmm. which has a royal warrant, the owner of that company, a woman, wrote a book called Tempest in a Decup, I think, and uh, the queen was not impressed and yanked yeah. her royal warrant that she's had for 40 years. So you right. can you can have them taken away as well as granted. Well, and, and Mohammed Al-Fayed, who is the father of, of the late Dodi Fayed, who, uh, yeah. who, who was Princess Diana's lover, right? And yeah. His, died his with her warrant, that night. Yeah, and died, died with her. His warrant got canceled. He owned a huge, a huge uh, Herod's. Yeah, Harrods is a huge, yeah, it's it's kind of like, yeah, Harrods Department Store, which is a huge, huge entity here in London. Um, he didn't lose his warrant. He burned his warrant. He felt that uh. the connection to the royal family was a curse after he lost his son. So he actually burned the royal yeah. warrant, which Harrods has had 
maybe one of the longest standing warrants in in this in this country. Is there something that they won't endorse? Oh, yeah, I won't, I won't shouldn't say endorse. There, there's there's certain Al- categories. Alcohol is okay. Alcohol is okay. Yeah, they they endorse a lot of alcohol. They won't endorse law firms, advertising agencies, public relations, party planners. Like they have a list of categories that aren't eligible. What else is coming up on the show this this season? Um, I have an interesting show, Ted, coming up on church signs. So as yeah. you may have noticed, since around the year 2000, <laughs> church signs have gotten really creative and very amusing and, and very humorous, right? Where they never were historically. Mm-hmm. So I, I do, I have a show coming up about church signs, how that whole trend started, why they do it. And it's interesting that because they use it for recruitment, of course, to try and, and attract people to the congregations, because the research revealed that the United Church in Canada, for example, loses one church per week because of dwindling congregations. Wow. And the Anglican Church in Canada said, this is a remarkable statement, that they see such a decline in their congregations that they think they will they will completely run out of members by 2040. It's wow. astounding because that's the, that's the biggest denomination in the Protestant uh, world is the Anglican, right? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that because there's, there's in, in the west end of Toronto, there's there's a segment a, a section of uh, Annette Street where there are four different churches all within about four blocks or three blocks of each other and I used to take that road to work every Saturday and in the course of two or three years three of them disappeared and turned into lofts wow yeah wow so now out of what were four churches is now just one church yeah. And one of the churches that, that disappeared was massive, and and it's still undergoing this. They this literally yeah. they kept it, they they kept the facade, yeah, and they just gutted the inside, and it's going to be like you know mil, multi million dollar uh, lofts in, in, one, in the little town we live in, um, just north of Huntsville. There's this big Baptist church that went for sale on in our downtown, like a the big, big, big turn of the century church. And it sold for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Like Jeez. it's, uh, and because the congregation got too small, you have these churches that can hold three or four hundred people, and every Sunday there's thirty people in the in the yeah. pews. So anyway, I do a a, a a very interesting show on church signs and how they're using humor, which some people feel is blasphemous, but uh, the the ministers are using great humor to attract uh, congregations. Well, I think the first example of that I saw was probably about a long, probably 10, 15 years yeah. ago uh, at Christmas time when one of the churches had posted a sign um, outside the church that said, Christ, the reason for the season. Right, right. And I that, thought, but, okay, well, you're making, you're, that's, yeah. that's a message. Now, yeah. now you're talking, people are turning to humor, though. Yeah, I, yeah. So the signs, the humor signs that they come up with are, are amazing. As a matter of fact, they're so, they're so good that there's being books written about church signs now, like coffee table books. You know, yeah. like one of my, a couple of the favorite ones that I mentioned in that show are uh, one said, um, Adam and Eve were the original people who didn't read the Apple's terms and conditions. <laughs> which is a very funny line right it's a very funny line and lent is not this is not the fuzz you find in your in your navel like just very <laughs> very funny and exposure to the sun prevents burning and of course sun is spelled s-o-n like they're very smart right and how how, how many of these signs have now turned political because especially in the united states because it's it's become the great divide politics in in the u.s now. yes that's for sure um, in my research, I really only saw maybe one or two signs that were political outside of church where everything else was spiritual, scripture based or funny. So I didn't mm-hmm. see a lot just that, or maybe yeah. they're not making the, the internet or not making these coffee table books. Maybe there's more out there than I know. I suggested some years ago, jokingly to a friend, I said, well, one day, you know, you're, you're going to see churches are going to be. Uh, they're going to be sponsored by by corporations. Like yeah. It's going to be Mc, McDonald's Holy Name of Mary Church. You know, and I'll probably burn in hell for even saying something like that. But that concept, although that's ridiculous, with the one that I put forward, I don't think it's that far fetched. It isn't. It isn't. When you think about 
I mean, the reason churches want a bigger congregation, of course, is not just for spiritual reasons, but also for tithing and giving up offerings and the, the, the weekly collection plate. So it's it, there's a money issue. There's a revenue issue involved there. So if there's if you get to the point where it's either accept McDonald's or close your doors, maybe they've got big decisions to make. And how many churches do you see now that have two different congregations in them? Like one will be an Anglican and the other one will be a... a something something similar i mean it'll, it'll be christian but but it'll it'll be of a different uh, nationality for yeah. example because yeah, you see that it, a lot now yeah you do and it, it is the christian uh, faith that is declining whereas muslims and uh, hindus and sikhs it, that world is increasing so it's yeah. the, it's the christianity that's declining here yeah terry o'reilly is my guest uh, under the influence is the program that you can catch on cbc weekly uh, Thursdays, twice weekly, actually, Thursdays and Saturdays at 11.30 a.m. It's on uh, Sirius XM Channel 169, Fridays at 4. And if you're in the Windy City of Chicago, WBEZ mm-hmm. is... <laughs> what? How do you pronounce that when you when you do the show? Do you have to say WBEZ? I, I, I say WBEZ, yeah. Yeah, okay. For that, for that show, yeah. There you go. Saturday at six thirty. How, how much different is that program than the program that is in in Canada? It really is the same. It's the same program. It's just when I do the promos for it, I will say WBEZ, but but the content of mm-hmm. the show is the same. Mm-hmm. So give me a couple more examples of, of what's coming up. I don't want you to give away the season, but just to, yeah, as a couple of teasers. Uh, I have a show coming up on this interesting trend that I've spotted of um, advertisers starting to use horror as a theme. And what's interesting about Mm. that, Ted, is that in in difficult times, like we're in now, the economy, the wars, the division, the pandemic, horror always has a resurgence in tough times, which is a weird thing. I guess people need a, uh, you know, a, um, a diversion in their lives. So horror becomes very popular. Horror movies start doing really well. And where audiences go, so do advertisers. So advertisers are starting for the really, the first time that I can remember using horror as a theme. So I'm, I'm about to write a show on on uh, advertisers, big ones like Ford and, uh, and other big brands like that starting to use horror, like trying to scare people in their commercials as, as entertainment. Which is really strange because you would think about it. I mean, like the, the, the between the war and pandemic and the economy, that's enough to scare the hell out of you, right there. <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. Right. But uh, I mean, it's it's everything is kind of branded content now in a way, and, because you know when you think of ads on YouTube, they're really two or three minutes long. I mean, the thirty second ad is kind of a uh, gone the way of the dodo. So they get, they have more room and more space to actually have a storyline. So they've chosen mm-hmm. to use horror as that storyline now, which I find very interesting. Sometimes yeah. even casting the product as the villain in the in the storyline, which is very interesting. Well, and I think that the, that and and I can't give you an example right now, but but I've seen examples, and we all have over, over the past years, a number of years, where products will make fun of themselves and self-deprecating humor is the strongest kind of humor. I think there is Canadian humor. It's more Canadian than American. And I'll tell you why I say that because over the years when I was an ad writer, Ted, I would write commercials for American companies as well. And whenever I wrote self-deprecating humor, which I love, which was probably my specialty. If I look back on my work, it never really flew in the U S they never really, saw the benefit or the charm of it. So I would have to go another way with the American ads as a rule. Whereas the Canadian ads I did for years and years and years, we'd be self-deprecating and it was just, people loved it. Yeah. Terry O'Reilly is my guest. In addition to uh, Under the Influence and uh, the occasional book that comes out, is there another book coming out soon, by the way? I, I'm, going, I, I'm just starting to think about my next book. So yes, there will be another one. Okay, my big mistake is is your last my book. My best and, mistake, by the yeah. way, my best mistake. It was yeah. originally the biggest, my biggest mistake, but then, then it, the, the cover gets you erased. That's turned right. into my best. And and I believe the cover was uh, won an award. Did it? It not? did. It did. It was such a great cover because it's it's so summed up the very core of that book, which yeah. was the the. I said to the uh, to the publisher Harper Collins when they asked me what I was thinking about for a cover I said give me an idea not a design 
And then they, their designer came back with writing my best mistake and then, you know, erasing it. So it just said my best mistake, which was exactly the core of the book that somebody's biggest yeah. mistake ends up being the best thing that ever happened to them. So it was, couldn't have been yeah. more ideal. Yeah. So in addition to a potential book coming out, another book coming out, because you've written a number of books in, in, in the past, along with Under the Influence, you also have a family business called uh, the Apostrophe Podcast Network. Yes. How many podcasts do you have now? I think we have about maybe about half a dozen podcasts right now uh, that are. And how many of these? And how many of these do you participate in personally? We have two of the six are homegrown, and the rest of them are very selectively we've taken on from outside. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of uh, pitches, but it's uh, we're very selective about what we take on, Ted, because we. You know, it's a lot of work to mount a podcast, as you know, because you've got to do, you, for all the reasons we said earlier, all the work that goes into them, we market our podcast because we know a thing or two about marketing. So if we're going to take on a show, we really have to believe it's got some legs. So yeah. we've been very selective historically. Okay. One of these podcasts uh, is called Backstage at the Vinyl Cafe, which is hosted by Jess Milton, who is the producer, uh, for year-long producer for years uh, for Stuart McLean. Right. How did that come to be? How did that come to your plate? Uh, I, had, I had the most wonderful meeting with Stuart years ago, and I, I released a little uh, short podcast about that meeting recently where I was thinking about touring under the influence across the country, like doing stage shows, doing live recordings of the show. And, and Stuart was such an old hand at, at traveling a show because he's a, he was an in industry. So I emailed yeah. Stuart one day. I didn't had, did not know him. We had never met. We were both CBC hosts, but that didn't really mean anything because there's lots of hosts. I emailed him and I said, can I pick your brain about touring a show? And he, his response back to me was you're coming for lunch. And that was mm -hmm. such a great thing. So sure enough, yeah. I, on the designated day, I went to his home and we had, and he prepared this great lunch and Jess Milton, his producer and, and Stuart and I sat at his kitchen table and we talked for three hours. So that's how I got to meet both of them. When Stuart passed away, which was shocking to me, I knew he was ill, but I didn't know he was that ill. It was really, really was quite, quite shocking to everybody and, and, and to me because I, I really, as I said, didn't know how ill he was. Anyway, Jess Milton uh, called me to, to just pick my brain about podcasting and we got to talking and I said to her, if you need a home for this podcast, we would love to take you on because I, I really adored Stuart and Jess is just absolutely terrific. And then we just had more conversations about it. And, uh, and lo and behold, Backstage at the Vinyl Cafe is debuting on January 20th as part of our network. And what's great about it, as you may have read, Ted, is there'll be two Stuart David Morley stories in every episode, but between mm -hmm. them, Jess Milton will tell the backstories of those stories, how Stuart came up with, with the ideas, funny things that happened on the road during that particular live recording. So it's, if you're a um, Vinyl Cafe fan, this is going to be such a great show for you. Yeah, so every story, every story tells a story. Um, the future of podcasting, people talk about, and the, the joke is, well, who doesn't have a podcast? And I think like a lot of things, when somebody becomes popular, so many people jump on it, and it's just a matter of time before the wheat gets separated from the chaff. Do you think that that's what we're happening now? Yeah, I do. Because the barrier to entry is pretty low. You can really do it on your computer. You don't even really need a recording studio, although it's always better. But the barrier to entry is low. But, you know, they say there's 4 million podcasts out there. Yeah. But if you look, there's a, a newsletter I follow called uh, Pod News. And when you look at it, every day it tells you how many new podcasts have been uh, uploaded. It's only about 40,000 new podcasts a day from about 150,000 podcasts. And the majority of podcasts never have a second or third podcast. Yeah. As soon as people figure out how difficult it is, how much work <laughs> it is, the numbers dwindle pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and if it's not the amount of work, it's the, uh, the lack of money that, that because people start thinking, wow, I'm going to sit at home and I'll spend a couple hours a week and I'll be pulling in 67,000, 70,000, just, <laughs> just as, just as a hobby. Right. Well, that's where, 
that ain't happening. That and ain't happening. what's misleading as well about the number of podcasts that, that are out there is that some of them have been done specific for a specific reason for a specific time period. Like there may be many documentaries, there may be four episodes. And, and because they're evergreen, they're always out there. So you can see, well, there's 4 million podcasts. Yeah, but this podcast was done sp- about a specific period in history, and it was only meant yeah. to cover four one-hour episodes. Yeah, there's a lot of limited limited series out there. We even did one ourselves, you know, where there's only eight episodes or something of that nature. It's pretty hard to make money if your business model is advertising. It's very hard to make money on a limited podcast series because by the, you know, eight podcasts, eight episodes later, you're just starting to build your audience and the show's over. Right. So it's very tough. You have to build up an audience before you can get uh, attract advertisers. The, the basic rule of thumb I've discovered is you need about between five and 10,000 downloads a week before you're even on the radar of advertising agencies and right. advertisers. And yet, to go back to our conversation, we were talking about some advertisers will will jump on a program or a, or a radio program or a television program or a podcast for that matter, not looking at the numbers, but looking at the nature of the program and how it fits their program or the host of that program and how it fits their 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 product. Yeah, and and, and as as I was saying earlier, Ted, I think that's always best because the fit is a, less of an interruption. Um, there's also podcasts that are branded content where podcasts are created for an advertiser. I'm not in that business, but there is companies out there that only do that. Yeah. So they'll create a, a really good podcast series for Ford, you know, and it's, it's not a big ad. It's actually got some really great content, but it's brought to you by Ford or brought to you by Wood Gundy or whatever it might be. So there's that side of podcasting too. Right. I remember reading years ago uh, that when Coca-Cola first began their venture into the advertising industry, that their philosophy was that you could not go anywhere um, in the United States. They wanted to get to this point. I'm talking not 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 I'm not talking residential areas, but you couldn't go two blocks without seeing a Coca-Cola ad. And if you walk down. Bloor Street in, in Toronto, where there are store after store after store after store, you pretty much can't go two blocks without seeing a Coca-Cola ad. That's very true. I mean, Coca-Cola is really one of the ubiquitous brands in this world. I uh, I did an episode on packaging many years ago in this in our series, and one of the interesting stories was when Coca-Cola decided that they needed a distinctive bottle design, which they did not have at that in their early days. Mm -hmm. The brief to the designer was, we want it to be so distinct that you could tell it was Coke in the, by feeling it in the dark or if it was broken on the sidewalk. And that's why that Coke bottle has that very distinct. Yeah. Right. Shape. Yeah. And I thought that was a great brief that even in the dark, you could tell it was Coke. Well, even, even the fact that people have, will refer to some people's eyewear saying you got like Coke glasses. This is the bottom of the Coca-Cola bottle with, with the thick, thick bottom. Right. Yeah, it becomes part of the language. It becomes a, a noun and an adjective. Yeah, exactly. It's quite fascinating. Always fascinating chatting with you, Terry. I look forward to listening to uh, Under the Influence, as, as, as I have for years. Uh, and again, it's available um, on podcast. And you can get that wherever you find your podcasts. And you can check it out on CBC Thursday, Saturdays, 1130 in the morning. Sirius XM Channel 169, Fridays at 4. And if you happen to be in Chicago, Saturday mornings when you wake up at 6.30, as you should be on Saturday morning, you can catch it on WBEZ. Terry O'Reilly, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you, Ted. Always great to talk to you. So once again, thanks for being with us. If it's your first time here, we appreciate it and hope you come back and hope you recommend our podcast to to your friends. And don't forget, follow us. Also, don't forget, if you get a chance, go online, fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallace and Podcast has been brought to you by Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. 
Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.